The West Penra Papers A Journey Through the Multiverse The First Level of Learning httpwestpenry.com Present and Future Challenges, PFC, Section PFC Paper No. 4, The Animus, Artificial Intelligence and Blank Slate Technology Part 2 By Wes Penra, Tuesday, June 14, 2011 4.1 Elongated Skulls vs. Skullbinding and Cranial Deformation An interesting thing with Dr. Neruda's depiction of the Cortum is that they are extremely tall, the Anunnaki can be 7 to 10 feet tall, with elongated skulls. According to Sitchin and LPGC, the A.A.M.I. and the Anunnaki, even if their skulls can be slightly elongated, they otherwise look pretty much like us, we have their genetics. However, Giant elongated skulls have been found in South America and elsewhere, and you can study them in some museums around the world. I would suggest you Google elongated skulls and do your research, it's very interesting, and the research is almost addictive. We can see the same traits in some of the Egyptian pharaohs as well, and very much so in Queen Nefertiti. Some people, who want to debunk this refer this special kind of skull to something called skull binding where some tribes bind the heads of young infants while the skeleton is still soft and this will bring about this trait. Although this is true, it's rather an attempt to copycat the old gods. The difference between the original ones and the ones that are skull-bound is the size of the skull and the jaws. I have heard suggestions that the elongated skulls that have been found belong to the Titans, who were deformed offspring of the Anunnaki mating with humans. For the records, the Kortum are not Titans, they are not related. It always puzzled me why the Anunnaki, as depicted in the Sumerian cuneiform is always wearing headgear and headdresses. Did they actually have elongated skulls and wanted to hide this from the humans? This contradicts the information I've received from Dr. Borden of LPGC, who says the Anunnaki look pretty much like us, but are usually much taller. The question is, the A.A.M.I. He is seeing in the link meeting. Do they wear headdresses? The readers may ask themselves why I don't just ask Dr. Borden this question, but over time I've learned that he is not very eager to answering questions he thinks are of less relevance. Also, as we now know, the humanoid species is very common in this galaxy, and the variation is mostly in length, skin color, and perhaps the shape of their heads. There is overwhelming evidence that those LPGC call the A.A.M.I are not one species working alone, but a dominant race in a galactic federation to which they belong. Therefore, it is not far-fetched to think that some of them have elongated skulls. Skullbinding and intentional cranial deformation has been common throughout history in most parts of the world. And most of these intrusions on infants have been in an effort to please, and look like, the gods. The question is, which gods? Skullbinding even happened in Egypt. People thought that if they extended the skulls, they would get larger brain and become more intelligent. As in comparison to whom? It is interesting that skull binding has been most common in Egypt, South Africa and South America, such as Peru, where the Anunnaki have had the greatest influence, aside from the three rivers in Mesopotamia. Is this the reason why we find tribes still doing it today and that we have found deformed skulls in these areas? But where do the larger? Deformed skulls come from hybrids? Pure Anunnaki? Or did the Anunnaki skull bind their own children within certain families? If the latter is true, that explains why we see the Anunnaki and their hybrids depicted both with normal skulls and deformed. It could also explain why the Kortum have elongated skulls, if Dr. Neruda is correct, they belong to a certain family or tribe of the A.A.M.I slash Anunnaki. Point in cases that it's very unlikely that Mark Hempel had a visitor, who traveled regular airline from New York to Minnesota, being 10 feet tall, with an elongated skull. It's more likely that someone else, more human-like looking, visited Mark in his home with a Spanish accent. But why a Spanish accent and why this unnaturally low baritone voice of the person speaking in the interview sessions by Mark Hempel from 2008? I don't know. Other than it's confusing and that's perhaps what it's meant to be, the person in the interview, 
who claims to be Mahunahi of the Kortum, may not want his true voice in a recording. These interviews can be downloaded in MP3 format from the Wingmaker's site for your consideration. It is evident that the Wingmaker's site was taken over by the Kortum. However, 15 and the Kortum are not our enemies, according to Dr. Neruda, they too want to save the planet from the incoming threat and wish for us to evolve, they just want to keep their work secret. Hence, you will see a lot of uplifting, spiritual information on the Wingmaker's site, which was put there by the Kortum. This information is true and you can feel it in your heart. Then there are other things, not so inspiring, which are mixed bags at best, and disinformation at worst. Is this confusing? It is meant to be. If there is a lot of truth in something and those who don't want this truth to be leaked need to take some kind of action. What is more effective than anything else more than killing the messenger often is to create a disinformation campaign on a large scale. However, for the clever there are ways to sort information from disinformation, listen and read with your heart. 5. 7 Super Universes, 7 Tributary Zones, and 7 Super Domains In the WMM they are talking about 7 Super Universes with a central universe in the middle, which is the universe of Source, the Prime Creator. Like some people pointed out in the Wingmaker's Q&A section, this sounds very similar to what is described in the Urantia book. Nahimahu replied that in some cases the Wingmakers share the philosophy with Urantia, but it's still quite different. However, when we look at it, it may not be so different after all. As we shall see, Dr. Neruda's presentation of the seven super universes coincide and fit pretty well with LPGCS seven super domains, but is a light version thereof. This is how the seven super universes are described in the WMM by Dr. Neruda. He says that the labyrinth group learned from the courtroom that the central universe is stationary and eternal while the seven super-universes are creations of time and revolve around the central universe in a counter-clockwise rotation. Surrounding these seven super-universes is outer or peripheral space, which is non-physical elementals consisting of non-baryonic matter or antimatter, which rotates around the seven super-universes in a clockwise rotation. This vast outer space is expansion room for the super-universes to expand into. The known universe that your astronomers see is mostly a small fragment of our super-universe and the expansion space at its outermost periphery. Hubble-based astronomy extrapolates, based on a fractional field of view, that there are 50 billion galaxies in our super-universe, each containing over 100 billion stars. However, most astronomers remain convinced that our universe is singular. It is not according to the Kortum. On the fringe of the central universe resides the central race, which contain the original human DNA template of creation. However, they are such an ancient race that they appear to us as gods, when indeed they represent our future selves. Time and space are the only variables of distinction. The central race is known to some as the creator gods who developed the primal template of the human species and then, working in conjunction with the life carriers, seeded the galaxies as the universes expanded. Each of the seven super-universes has a distinctive purpose and relationship with the central universe via the central race based on how the central race experimented with the DNA to achieve distinct, but compatible physical embodiments to be soul carriers. The central race is divided into seven tribes, and they are master geneticists and the progenitors of the humanoid race. In effect, they are our future selves. Quite literally they represent what we will evolve into in time and towards in terms of space. The Labyrinth group believed that the Wingmakers are representatives of the central race, and that they created our particular human genotype to become suitable soul carriers in our particular universe. The ancient Aero site is part of a broader, interconnected system of seven sites installed on each continent. Together, we believe this system constitutes a defensive technology. And Dr. Saunter, in the opening to the Dr. Neruda interviews, is convinced that the central race, which, from what the Labyrinth group have concluded, are equivalent with the Wingmakers and from the Pleiades. Barbara Marciniak's Pleiadian renegade group are saying that they seeded mankind together with the Lyrans, so a consistent picture is starting to emerge. The ancient Aero site in New Mexico, 
the one and only Wingmaker's site that's been found, at least as far as public knowledge goes, is, according to the WMM, although I believe there are at least 12 sites the Guardians say 24, which is 12x2, just one of seven sites, also called tributary zones in the WMM, spread out over the continents of Earth. Each of these tributary zones on Earth corresponds with one super-universe, where the site in New Mexico most likely corresponds with our own. If this is true, there is a tributary zone, according to the WMM, in the core in the galactic center of each living galaxy in our universe. They are, symbolically or literally, located on planets very close to the galactic core. And, like advanced physics is aware of today, the core of the galactic center, at least in a spiral galaxy like our own, consists of a central sun and a gigantic black hole. This black hole is what the Pleiadians call the womb of the mother, i.e. the birth center of the galaxy. It's like a super-orgasm where the nebulae and stars were spread in a rotational orbit around its center. The fact that we are now aligning ourselves with the galactic center is a phenomenon known in mainstream physics as well, but is pointed out both by Marciniak's Pleiadian group and Mahunahi in the interview sessions with Mark Hempel. Both say that this has to do with change in consciousness. People who have learned to vibrate on a higher frequency and to keep their frequency on that level most of the time, despite of turmoil around them will experience this new boost of energy coming in from the galactic center differently than someone who has not prepared at all. So, some people will become highly enlightened during this time period, while others will be overwhelmed by the strength of these energies. If a person has a lot of anxiety, hate, anger, resentment, and judgment in his or her personality, these traits will amplify. On the other side, these who have learned how to love, appreciate things, forgive themselves and others, apply humility in life, be compassionate, understand self and others, and apply valor in life, will have those traits amplified, and will use them as a springboard towards higher dimensions and frequencies. Interesting also is that the seven superdomains explored by LPGC correspond somewhat with the seven super-universes. It is my conviction that Dr. Neruda knew this when he did his interviews with Sarah, but needed to simplify it, or no one would understand what he was talking about. Same thing when the Labyrinth group took over the WMM, they explain in their liminal cosmogony briefly how the seven super-universes are connected, then explaining that this is an excerpt of a grander work which will be revealed later. I would say that this grander work, which will be released by the Cortum and the Labyrinth group, is quite similar to that of LPGCS working model, see physics paper number 1. Here, the super-universes, or super-domains, as described by LPGC, http colon slash slash lifephysicsgroup.org, are as follows. 1. Prime Causal 2. Thought 3. Unisonic 4. Logomorphic 5. Syntonic Diffusive 6. Templaic or Quantum Potential 7. 4. Space Slash Time Obviously, the experience upon which we have our main attention is in 4. Space Slash Time, although we exist simultaneously in all superdomains. These superdomains correspond to the 7 super-universes, used both in the WMM and the Urantia book although they are approached differently. The void corresponds to the peripheral expansion space in the Wingmaker Super Universe version, see figure 9 above. There is much more to the earthly seven tributary zones and with the working model than I have brought up here and in other previous papers, but that is material for another time and not in the scope of what we are discussing here. I find it interesting, though, that both the WMM and LPGC are working with the seven system, while the Pleiadians and the Guardians, and many other metaphysical contacts, are working with the Twelve system, saying that this is the system within the human bio-mind is operating, and in expansion, we will tune into the Thirteen system. 6. The Central Race as Creator Gods Dr. Neruda in the interviews confirms what the Pleiadians have said about seeding the universe and provide it with functioning soul carriers star. He says that the Central Race experimented many times with different kinds of soul carriers until they formed one that was good enough to take a particle of the source energy force into the outer, expanding universes. If not being able to do so, 
its experience in the third dimension, or four space slash time, would be of limited value, as it can't bring any of that back directly to Prime Creator. The central race holds the genetic template, or archetype, of the human species, in spite of what form it takes on, or what time it lives in. So long as it is a sole carrier of intelligent life forms in the sense of bipedal beings with a torso, two arms, and two legs, the central race holds the genetic template. All other, lesser developed versions are drawn towards this archetype like a magnetic force. All versions of the humanoid species are just time-shifted versions of the central race. At least this is the view of the courtroom. 7. Prophecy Prophecy is a pretty wide but interesting subject, because there are numerous such since the beginning of time. In the WMM several different ancient prophecies are discussed of which some of them are not even known to common man, and these are some of the prophecies supposed to come true in our time. To distinguish between the WMM prophecies and other significant ones, I'm going to categorize them and explain them one by one. The Prophecy Papers which will be released after the first batch of papers, are going to go deeper into the other ones. There are many, many ancient texts dealing with prophecies, and only a handful are known to the public. Most of them are hidden within secret societies and organization who have locked them in, only to be viewed by high-level, very trusted members. The ACIO, and the Labyrinth Group in particular, have access to many of them, if not most according to Dr. Neruda. These prophecies are pretty powerful when comes to describing the 21st century and its challenges. Fifteen got access to them when he became the director of research for the ACIO. Being able to leave your body while doing remote viewing is nothing new. People have been able to do so for ages but only in organized forms within the mystery schools and other occult orders. This can be accomplished on an observational level where you don't interfere with what in going on at the place you are going to. Instead of just going to a certain place in horizontal time, which is our normal timeline, some have been able to access future events from a vertical access point. People who know how to do it can then go into the future, or even back from the future, to this time from the vertical access point. However, they are unable to change any events, still, they can see what is happening there with quite some clarity. According to Dr. Neruda, some of these time travelers have come in contact with the wing makers and have been provided messages about the future, messages which have been recorded in symbols, pictures, or in extinct languages like Sumerian, Akkadian, Mayan, and Jacobson. One interesting and quite alarming part of the prophecies, which also seems to be a common theme from ancient texts and symbols, etc. is something that is supposed to happen in the early part of the 21st century around 2011, this is all according to Dr. Neruda. I haven't had the chance to verify, or look into this yet as of its validity. The major institutions, like the United Nations, will be infiltrated by an alien race. This race is a predator race with technologies way more sophisticated than our own. Being aware of humanity's obsessive interest in TTP's number the last 40 to 50 years, it shouldn't be a problem for this alien race to more or less make any deal they want with us. They will pose as humanoids, but are really a blend of human and android, in other words, they are synthetics. This alien species has as one of its imperatives to establish a one-world government on Earth and rule as its executive power. This is one, perhaps the most, challenging thing we have to deal with in the very near future, according to Dr. Neruda and the Labyrinth Group. These prophecies have been kept out of public domain, and were also meant to be kept secret within the Labyrinth Group so they could deal with the problem in isolation. However, that changed when Dr. Neruda defected and the Wing Makers site was launched in 1998. Whether this prophecy about the alien race is true or not, time events are not set in stone due to that people are creating their own reality every second of the day, and so are other beings in the universe. Therefore, prophecies, the older they are, the less accurate they may be when comes to pinpointing a certain time frame, and even the event itself. If we are lucky, it's not going to happen. Anyhow, an invasion is not likely to happen this year but a probe will apparently be put in orbit around Earth to see how our species have developed, if at all. 
This group of artificial intelligence aliens, whom we call the Animus, visited us already 8,866 years ago, counted from 2011 and back, but then thought we were too primitive to care about. What they would think now, however, is another issue.